Page 56, please. Principles that are important and fundamental to studying pressure. Number one, pressure is proportional to the height of a fluid. Now we saw that with liquids. In the case of liquids, it's a linear increase with depths. Wouldn't be the case with gases. For example, air pressure does not decrease linearly as you rise from the surface of the earth, but there is still the relationship that the higher the altitude, the less the pressure, the closer to sea level, the greater the pressure. Air pressure is less in Mexico City or Denver, Colorado compared to sea level because Mexico City and Denver, Colorado are both about one mile above sea level. Pressure is equal in all directions in a fluid. So at the front of the zeppelin, at the back of the zeppelin, the top, the bottom, the middle, pressure is all the same. Think about it. The pressure is created by collision of gas molecules or fluid molecules with the walls of the container these are random motions, so on average they'll be the same in all directions. Pascal's principle states that external pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid. So the pressure will be the same, unchanged, through a system. Now this is only true for static fluids, fluids at rest when they're not moving. Because we're going to see later that when fluids move or flow, they will lose pressure due to friction. There has to be some sort of energy sacrificed due to friction and its pressure in that case. This is difficult for me to visualize. The slope of the container has no influence on the pressure at a given depth in a fluid. So we look at P1, P2, P3, P4. They're all at the same depth in the same fluid and therefore the pressure must be the same. But just looking at this, I would have thought that there'd be greater pressure at P1 than P2 because the wedge widens rather than narrows, but that's not the case. Page 57. The total pressure in a fluid is the sum of the pressure of the liquid plus atmospheric pressure above the fluid, and it's called absolute pressure. So if you look at this creature that's in the water, the total pressure on this animal is the fluid pressure which we calculate as P equals rho times G times H or P is equal to D times H plus if we consider that the system is open to the atmosphere we also have atmospheric pressure PATM and the sum of those two is called the absolute pressure which means total pressure Here's the equation here. The absolute or total pressure is the pressure of the fluid, rho GH, plus atmospheric pressure, PATM. We can write it also as DH plus PATM. Here's another illustration of the same thing. So the total pressure at the bottom of this glass of liquid would be the fluid pressure plus atmospheric pressure, and that's collectively called atmospheric pressure. Right, so here's a problem for us to do to give some practice to this. Without the aid of scuba tanks, pearl divers are known to dive to a depth of 50 feet, calculate the fluid pressure and the absolute pressure in PSI on a diver at a depth of 50 feet, and that would be in seawater. Now, we'll assume the density of seawater is 1.027 grams per cubic centimeter. Different oceans have different salinities. They are slightly different. This value comes from the CRC handbook, so it's a standard value for seawater. Again, I'd like you to do it in all three systems to get comfortable with the units. P absolute equals rho GH, pressure depth equation plus P atmospheric. We'll go ahead and calculate the fluid pressure first and then we'll add the atmospheric pressure. In the SI system, P is equal to weight density of water is 1000 kilograms 
per cubic meter. Now that's fresh water. We're told that the density of seawater is 1.027 grams per cubic centimeter, which means its specific gravity is 1.027. So I can just multiply this by 1.027. The gravitational constant in the SI system is 9.807. Newtons per kilogram. And the height we're given was 50 feet, or the depth. We need that in meters, so that's 3.28083 feet per meter. And that works out to be 15.24 meters. Right, so for this I get. 1.535 times 10 to the 5 and the units will be newtons per square meter which is pressure, right? or pascals now we're asked to convert this all to PSI so let's go to pounds per square inch I'll convert from newtons to pounds Recall there's 4.448 newtons in a pound. And I need to go from square meters to square inches. I could convert from square meters to square feet to square inches. Or I could go from square meters to square centimeters to square inches. And I think I'm going to choose the latter just to stay in the metric system as long as I can. We saw earlier that we could convert from per square meter to per square centimeter that was a factor of 10 to the 4 square centimeters per square meter and now we need to go from per square centimeter to per square inch so for that I know that 1 inch is 2.54 centimeters so if I square that I'll say 1 square inch is equal to it works out to be 6.452 square centimeters. So 6.452 square centimeters is one square inch. And if you work through all of that, you should get units of pounds per square inch. Let's see. Newtons are gone. Square meters are canceled. Square centimeters are canceled. We're left with pounds per square inch and the value for that works out to be 22.3 pounds per square inch or PSI so that's the pressure due to the depth of the fluid that's rho GH if we add to that atmospheric pressure which was given as 14.7 PSI then the absolute pressure or total pressure works out to be 37.0 psi at a depth of 50 feet in seawater right let's do this now using the CGS system again it's to gain comfort with using these units so one gram per cubic centimeter times the specific gravity of seawater 1.027 times the gravitational constant in the CGS system is 980.7 dynes per gram and we'll need the depth in not in meters but in centimeters that would be 1524 centimeters so you can recall from the last exercise we did this is one power of 10 greater it's 1.535 times 10 to the sixth dynes per square centimeter which we could convert to newtons per square meter and then pounds per square inch and we'll get the same value alright one more time let's do the British system calculation pressure is equal to mass density is 1.9403 slugs per cubic feet times the specific gravity of water 1.027 times the gravitational constant in the British system 3217 
pounds per slug times a depth of 50 feet. This works out to be 3208 pounds per square foot. We just need to convert this to pounds per square inch. So we'll have cancel out per square feet, go to per square inches. So we know that one foot is 12 inches. So if we square that, we have one square foot is 144 square inches. So we divide by 144 square inches per foot. And this works out to be 22.3 pounds per square inch, or PSI, as before. So we have fluid pressure, 22.3 pounds per square inch. Standard atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSI. And that's a total of 37.0 PSI, and that would be the absolute pressure, ABS. Let's move along to page 58, atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure results from the weight of air above us. Air, like water, is a fluid and has mass, and we live at the bottom of a sea of air. Most of our atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen, lies closest to the Earth, but extends to approximately 80 kilometers high. It's not an exact boundary. And that's the stratosphere. So the, the height of air above the Earth's surface is approximately 80 kilometers, or about 50 miles. And that height of fluid above us is a weight per unit area. It exerts pressure. So standard atmospheric pressure is defined as one atmosphere. And that's approximately what we'd measure at sea level, but of course it varies with the weather. But the standard value is one atmosphere, which is equivalent to 14.7 psi. That's the same pressure that would be exerted by 33.9 feet of fresh water. A little bit less seawater, because seawater is denser, it would be approximately 33 feet of seawater. I say approximately because the salinity of seawater does vary a little bit, so it will be approximately 33. We'll calculate it later. Now, water is much denser than air, and so the depth of water is much less than the depth of air for a given pressure. Makes sense, right? Now, let's think about mercury. Mercury is 13.6 times denser than water, so it's going to take a relatively small height of mercury. A column of mercury only 76 centimeters high is equal to atmospheric pressure. If you convert that from centimeters to inches, it's 29.92 inches is the height of a mercury column that is exactly the same as atmospheric pressure. So we often use columns of mercury to measure atmospheric pressure because it's convenient. Now since mercury is 13.6 times more dense than water, it makes sense that a column of water would be 13.6 times larger to exert the same pressure as a column of mercury. So if atmospheric pressure is 0.76 meters of mercury, which is the same as 76 centimeters of mercury, then multiply by 13.6, and that's a column of water 10.3 meters of water high. So this is standard atmospheric pressure in a variety of units. Let's look at them. 14.696 pounds per square inch. That's 2116 pounds per square foot. It's 1.01325 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter, which are pascals, or 1.01325 times 10 to the 6th dynes per square centimeter, or 101 decimal 325 kilopascals. That's the unit that the weather persons usually quote. And all of these values are one atmosphere. That's equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury, or millimeters of mercury is sometimes referred to as tor, named after Evangelista Torricelli, uh, an Italian physicist who came up with the barometer. That's 76 centimeters of mercury, 
Convert that to inches, 29.92 inches of mercury. If you watch the American Weather Station, you'll probably hear it quoted that way. That's equivalent to 33.90 feet of fresh water. Exerts the same pressure as 76 centimeters of mercury. It's about 33 feet of seawater. And there are other units such as bars, 1.01325 bars. So a bar is almost exactly or very close to one atmosphere. Bar is more of a nautical term and 1013.25 millibars. And there are others as well. Let me just point out to you that pressure, which is force per unit area, we can take this equation, multiply numerator and denominator by the same value. In this case, it will be displacement or distance. And force times displacement is work. Area times distance or displacement is volume. So you can actually calculate pressure in terms of energy per unit volume that we'll see later on. One of the nice things about having so many units for standard atmospheric pressure is it makes it very easy to interconvert in problems that require pressure conversions. We don't necessarily have to go back to rho gh each time. We can simply flip between kilopascals, pounds per square feet, pounds per square inch, or whatever we need using our standard values. Let's get some more practice. I noticed some of the gas stations recently use units of kilograms per square centimeter on their air pressure hoses. What is that? Let's work it out. Let's convert 14.696, that's standard atmospheric pressure, to kilograms per square centimeter. So how many kilograms per square centimeter is equal to 14 point six nine six pounds per square inch. We're going to convert from square inches to square centimeters and we'll convert from pounds to kilograms. We've actually had these conversions before. It's good to review. Let's convert from pounds to kilograms. You can look this up on tables you're given. There's two point two zero four six two pounds per kilogram. We'll convert from per square inches to per square centimeters. We derived that previously. One square inch is 6.452 square centimeters. So square inches cancel and pounds cancel. That works out to be 1.03 kilograms per square centimeter. That's one atmosphere, and so one atmosphere is approximately one kilogram per square centimeter, and it's also approximately one bar, very close. In experiment eight, you'll need to convert a height of water in a column in inches of water to a pressure in pascals. So let's do that conversion now, and you can use it for experiment eight when you get there. A typical value of water height on the pressure table would be 61.5 inches of water. I want to convert that to pascals. A pascal is a newton per square meter. And this is inches of water. Now we could use the density of water and the height to calculate a pressure using rho gh. But now that we have all these conversion factors, it's really quite simple. We'll simply convert from inches of water to feet of water, 12 inches per foot, and we have a conversion using standard atmospheric pressure from feet of water to any other unit, including pascals. So feet from inches divide by 12, 12 inches per foot. We use now we have feet of water. We know that there are 33.90 feet of water height is one atmosphere, and one atmosphere is also 101,325 pascals. And that works out to be 1.53 times 10 to the 4 pascals. Pressure conversions become very easy 
when we have a host of these values, most of which you'll be given. Could you convert atmospheric pressure, so one atmosphere pressure, as 33.90 feet of fresh water? How many feet of seawater would exert the same pressure? Remember the specific gravity of seawater? We're using a value of 1.027. So seawater is slightly denser than freshwater. Would it take more seawater to exert one atmosphere pressure? Would it be more than 33.9 feet high for this column of seawater? Or would it take less seawater to exert atmospheric pressure? Would it be a lower column? Well, since seawater is denser, it would take less height of seawater compared to fresh water. And the ratio will be the ratio of specific gravities. The specific gravity of seawater is 1.027. The specific gravity of fresh water is 1. So this number is going to get slightly smaller if we convert to an equivalent pressure in seawater. Smaller by the ratio of specific gravities. So 1.000 specific gravity of fresh water divided by 1.027 specific gravity of seawater. So it's actually going to be 33.00 feet of seawater. Now, we'll look at the units in just a second, but think about if this makes sense. It's going to take slightly less seawater to exert the same pressure of freshwater because seawater is denser. It makes sense, right? It has to be. Now look at the units. Do they cancel? We've got fresh water, fresh water. They don't cancel, do they, at all? Seawater. They don't cancel because you can't use dimensional analysis for inverse relationships. Right? This is inverse. The greater the density of the fluid, the less will be required for a given pressure. It's not direct, it's inverse. Anytime you have inverse relationships, you can't use dimensional analysis. You have to use either memorized formulas, which I advise you against, or use logic and use logical statements and it works all the time. There are a number of problems at the end of this chapter and you are now assigned problems 1A through E. They begin on page 82. So A through E should be doable for you now. Problem 1A how many atmospheres is 506 megapascals? Megapascals is a metric multiplier. You absolutely must know all the metric multipliers. They will not be given to you. That's expected. So using all these conversion factors for atmospheric pressure makes this type of conversion really simple. We can convert this to either pascals or kilopascals, and then from kilopascals or pascals to atmospheres. I'm going to use kilopascals. So from a megapascal to a kilopascal looks like a factor of a thousand. Right? There's one thousand kilopascals in a megapascal. And then we know from the data I will give you that atmospheric pressure is 101.325 kilopascals. That's equal to one atmosphere. So it's that simple of a calculation. You're going to multiply by 1,000 and divide by 101.325. That comes out to 4990 atmospheres. Looks about right. All right, for B, we have uh, how many pascals equals 22.6 millimeters of mercury? We can convert that directly using our conversions for atmospheric pressure. There's 101,325 pascals is one atmosphere, and there's 760 millimeters of mercury 
is equivalent to one atmosphere. This comes out to three zero one zero pascals. C. How many feet of water is twenty five point zero psi? We can convert directly. There are in one atmosphere fourteen point six nine six psi and thirty three point nine zero feet of fresh water is one atmosphere and that's fifty seven point seven feet of water it's that simple so you should do D and E as well at this point right let's go back to page 59 so we've learned how to calculate pressure using the pressure depth equation rho G H or D H we've learned about atmospheric pressure and all of its units we've learned about absolute pressure the sum of the atmospheric plus fluid pressure the balance of this chapter deals with pressure measurement devices that are used industrially let's start with weather forecasting standard atmospheric pressure is a physical constant defined as one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury or 29.9 inches of mercury or 101.325 kilopascals but the actual atmospheric pressure at a given time is not constant it varies with geographic location it varies with height above sea level it varies with the temperature weather patterns seasons and time this barometer is called a well manometer or a cistern barometer so atmospheric pressure is well measured that's a bit of a pun because it's called a well manometer atmospheric pressure is well measured by means of a cistern barometer how do we make one of these now I actually forgot what book I scanned this from my apologies to the publisher I just don't remember but it's a good picture so take a glass tube that's open at one end and closed at the other fill it with mercury to the very top no air put your finger over the open end make sure you're wearing a glove carefully put the open end that's covered with your finger into the pool of mercury and then raise it upright kind of like this then remove your finger and allow the mercury to fall will it fall completely if you're not sure make sure you watch the video for which I posted a link it's called atmospheric pressure it's probably only a minute long but it shows it very well no the mercury will not fall completely it'll stop falling when its height exerts the same pressure as atmospheric pressure pushing against it and so the height of mercury is a measure of atmospheric pressure if atmospheric pressure was exactly one atmosphere then the height of mercury supported would be 76 centimeters and that's where we come up with that value that 76 centimeters is one atmosphere atmospheric pressure is measured by meteorologists and reported on local TV and radio broadcasts because it's a good indicator of weather forecasts high atmospheric pressure near 760 mercury usually indicates clear skies whereas low atmospheric pressure say less than 745 millimeters of mercury usually indicates overcast cloudy or rainy weather and of course actual values will vary with the latitude and the altitude of a particular geographic location on page 60 we're going to look at some gauges that read pressure but let me first have you look at this tire and tell me what the pressure in the tire is what's the pressure in the tire many people will say well there's no pressure in the tire because the tire is flat but is that really true is there no pressure in the tire isn't there still some air in the tire bouncing around exerting pressure what's the real pressure in the tire the pressure in the tire is actually atmospheric pressure right? that's not no pressure it's atmospheric pressure now here's a typical pressure gauge that's used to read pressure in a tire and notice it's connected to the atmosphere and guess what it says it says zero it's broken atmospheric pressure is not zero if it was we'd be in big trouble 
atmospheric pressure is 14.7 psi. This gauge should be reading about up here if it was reading correctly. Obviously it's not reading correctly and that's obviously that's not the intent of the gauge, is it? See, many gauges, not all, but many gauges are calibrated to read zero pressure at atmospheric pressure. Why is that? Well, like in the tire gauge, you don't really care what the total pressure is. You really want to know how much greater than atmospheric it is, right? Typical tire pressure should be about, it depends on the tire, but anywhere from 36 to 44 psi greater than atmospheric, right? So this pressure that the gauge reads is called gauge pressure. And gauge pressure is not the true pressure. The gauge pressure is the true pressure minus one atmosphere. Take away one atmosphere pressure from the absolute pressure and you get the gauge pressure. Look at these two gauges. These are both connected to atmosphere. The one on the left is reading approximately 30 and the unit is inches of mercury. Well that's right, isn't it? Atmospheric pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury, so the gauge on the left is correct. And look at the designation, it says inches HGA, meaning absolute. That's the true pressure. They sell gauges like that. Look at the gauge on the right. What's it read? It reads zero. But it's also connected to atmosphere, so is it broken? Well no, it's been calibrated that way. Notice the units inches of mercury G, G for gauge. So this is a gauge pressure gauge. Odd words, eh? It's a gauge that's reading gauge pressure. And gauge pressure is one atmosphere less than atmospheric. Both types of gauges are in use. They differ by one atmosphere. It's really that simple, although it sounds very complicated. So absolute pressure refers to the total pressure. Absolute zero pressure would be complete vacuum, no pressure at all. Gauge pressure, which many gauges are calibrated to read, is the total pressure minus one atmosphere. So P gauge would be absolute pressure minus one atmosphere. Take a look at this diver's gauge. See on the left, the diver's gauge is open to the atmosphere and it says, guess what, zero. It's broken too, right? Well, no, not really. See, the diver really isn't interested as to how deep he is below the top of the stratosphere, which is what you'd be measuring if you measured total pressure. The diver's interested as to how deep he is below the surface of the water, right? At sea level, we want to say that's zero, and then how far are we below the surface of the water? How many atmospheres pressure ab above atmospheric, greater than atmospheric? That's the gauge pressure. So in such a case as a diver's gauge, the gauge pressure is calculated from the pressure depth equation, rho gh or dh. It's simply the pressure of the fluid above that point, the pressure of the water in that case. The absolute pressure, which the gauge does not measure, would be the gauge pressure, rho gh, plus the atmosphere, right? P gauge plus P atmospheric. If a diver's pressure gauge were placed in a container and the container was partially evacuated, what would happen? Well, the gauge is already at zero, right? It would try to go negative if it could, if the dial could go negative. The gauge pressure, if it could read negative, would read negative even though there would still be some pressure left. We didn't go to complete vacuum if we just partially evacuated. It is impossible to have a negative absolute pressure. Once you completely evacuate a system, then the absolute pressure is zero. And the largest possible negative gauge pressure is minus one atmosphere. Take a look at page 61. I hope this illustration will help. So let's say that this green line represents atmospheric pressure. It's one atmosphere. Point A has a higher pressure. It's 0.4 atmospheres higher than atmospheric pressure. So if you had a gauge pressure gauge, it would read 0.4 atmospheres. It's 0.4 atmospheres above atmospheric. The atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure is 1.4 atmospheres absolute. 
at atmospheric pressure, well, the gauge pressure would be atmospheric pressure minus one atmosphere. It would read zero. In other words, if you had your gauge pressure gauge, the, your tire pressure gauge at atmospheric pressure, it reads zero because gauge pressure is atmospheric minus one. Now, there's no vacuum at atmospheric pressure. What happens if you evacuate a little bit, not completely to complete vacuum, but just say you bring it down 0.2 atmospheres less than atmospheric? What would the gauge pressure reach if it could? Well, the gauge pressure is absolute minus one atmosphere. So if the absolute pressure here is 0.8, I took 0.2 away, there's 0.8 remaining. Absolute pressure is 0.8 minus one atmosphere. The gauge pressure would be minus 0.2 atmospheres gauge. And that means the vacuum is 0.2 atmospheres. So you see that vacuum is numerically the same as gauge pressure, but they're opposite sign. So here we have the absolute pressure is still 0.8 atmospheres. The gauge pressure is negative 0.2, meaning it's 0.2 less than atmospheric. And the vacuum is plus 0.2 atmospheres of vacuum. If you completely evacuate this, then the absolute pressure has to be zero. And the gauge pressure would be, well, 0 minus 1 for atmospheric. That's absolute minus 1 atmosphere pressure. It's negative 1 atmospheres gauge. That's as low a gauge pressure as you could get. And the vacuum would be 1 atmosphere vacuum. That's full vacuum. You can't get any vacuum greater than 1 atmosphere. Once you remove the entire atmospheric pressure, there's no pressure left, and the vacuum is full vacuum 1 atmosphere. Let's skip ahead to page 63. The safe pressure for most standard automobile tires is 35 psi. However, some service stations have their pumps, air pumps, calibrated in newtons per square centimeter. Calculate the equivalent pressure in newtons per square centimeter. State whether this is absolute or gauge. Well, Hopefully it's gauge because it's measuring tire pressure, right? That's the idea. So 35 psi, how many newtons per square centimeter is 35 pounds per square inch? Here's an, yet another unit of pressure. We can convert from pounds to newtons and from square inches to square centimeters. We'll cancel out pounds and go to newtons. One pound is 4.448 newtons. We can convert from per square inches to per square centimeters. We saw previously that one square inch is 6.452 square centimeters. Square inches cancel, pounds cancel. Our unit is newtons per square centimeter. The answer is 24.1 newtons per square centimeter. Bottles of carbonated beverages, soda pops, are generally pressurized to four atmospheres absolute, which is the same as saying they're pressurized to three atmospheres gauge. A balloon is pressurized to 0.4 atmospheres greater than atmospheric pressure. State the absolute and the gauge pressure in the balloon. So it's 0.4 atmospheres greater than atmospheric. So the absolute pressure is atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure. So the gauge pressure is 0.4. That's how much greater it is than atmospheric. And atmospheric is 1 atmosphere plus 0.4 atmospheres. So the absolute pressure is 1.4 atmospheres, right? Does that make sense? If the balloon is 0.4 atmospheres greater than atmospheric, the total pressure is 1.4 atmospheres. But what's the gauge pressure? Well, the gauge pressure just gets rid of the atmospheric. It zeroes it out. The gauge pressure is 0.4. If you wanted to calculate it, you could say P gauge equals absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. 
is 1.4 minus 1 is plus 0.4 atmospheres. The student vacuum filters her precipitate in a Buchner funnel. The vacuum in the lab is set to 25 inches of mercury. That's the vacuum. State the gauge pressure and absolute pressure in inches of mercury. So we have not complete vacuum. What would complete vacuum be? Complete vacuum would be 30 inches of mercury. That's 29.9 inches is one atmosphere. Keep it simple, 30 inches. So what's the total pressure remaining in here? If atmospheric pressure is 30 inches and you take away 25, that means the pressure remaining, the absolute pressure that remains in this container would be 5 inches of mercury. Right? What's the gauge pressure? P gauge, if you want to calculate it, is the absolute pressure minus atmospheric which is 5 inches of mercury minus 30 inches of mercury which is negative 25 inches of mercury. The gauge pressure is negative 25. When the pressure is less than atmospheric, the gauge pressure will be negative. When the pressure is greater than atmospheric, the gauge pressure is positive. So if the gauge pressure is minus 25, it means the vacuum is equal to plus 25 inches of mercury, which is what was stated in the problem, right? 25 inches of mercury vacuum. Right, so we should be able to do the rest of problem number one now. So we go back to page 82. I previously assigned A through E. Let's do F through L. Right, so F looks pretty straightforward. To convert from gauge to absolute, remember we simply have to add atmospheric. So P, absolute equals P gauge plus P atmospheric. So in this case, in F, P absolute will be the gauge pressure, which is given as 10.0 PSI gauge, and then atmospheric is 14.7 uh, PSI, that's atmospheric, for a total of 24.7 PSI absolute. In G, we want to convert from 2 PSI gauge to millimeters of mercury absolute. So we have two conversions to make. We have to convert PSI to millimeters of mercury. We have to convert from gauge to absolute. It doesn't really matter what order you do it in, it comes out the same. I'm going to go with PSI to millimeters of mercury first. 2.00 PSI to millimeters of mercury. Atmospheric pressure, there's 760 millimeters of mercury. For every 14.70 PSI. So that equals 103 millimeters of mercury. Now that's still the gauge pressure, so if you add atmospheric, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, this is gauge, this is atmospheric, the sum will be 863 millimeters of mercury, and that would be the absolute pressure. In H, we have 700 millimeters of mercury absolute to feet of water in gauge pressure. Again, we have to convert millimeters of mercury to another unit, feet of water, we go from absolute to gauge. Again, the, the order is arbitrary. I'm going to convert directly to feet of water, and then I'll convert from absolute to gauge. So 700 millimeters of mercury is almost a full atmosphere. There's 700 millimeters of mercury to feet of water. There's 33.90 feet of water for 760 millimeters of mercury. That's equal to 31.2 
two feet of water and that is absolute so if you subtract atmospheric you'll get gauge pressure so if I subtract 33.90 feet of water this is absolute minus atmospheric we'll get gauge that is negative 2.68 feet of water and that's gauge now I don't know that we are warranted carrying all those sig figs but I'm going to report them in any case I'll report three anyway I think you could do the rest and the, the answers are posted on the notes so or you can ask me in class page 64 please pressure in closed containers so picture this tank as being a, a steel tank but if the lid is open then the total pressure in the bottom of this tank P absolute would be the sum of the fluid pressure this is rho G H and if it's open to the atmosphere if there's no lid on this then we have the atmospheric pressure as well acting and the absolute pressure is the gauge pressure which is called rho G H plus atmospheric pressure right what if the tank is sealed and closed? There's a rigid steel wall. Atmospheric pressure has no influence on what's inside the tank. The, the steel tank is well able to deflect any pressure influence from the outside. Then what's the total pressure here? The absolute pressure. Well, it'd be the pressure due to the fluid. This pressure is rho G H. And if there's a vapor pressure in the tank, say it's something that's low boiling, then it would be plus the vapor pressure. But what if it's something like sulfuric acid? Sulfuric acid boils at a very high temperature. It virtually has no vapor pressure. Let's assume this is empty. There's no air in the tank. It's just completely evacuated. There's no pressure. Then the pressure in the tank would simply be rho G H. Now that pressure in the tank can be measured with two different types of gauges. You could measure it with an absolute pressure gauge and it would tell you the actual total value in the tank. But you could also put a gauge pressure gauge on it, the type you would use to me measure the pressure in your tire and it would measure one atmosphere or less. You can report gauge pressure and absolute pressure within systems in which atmospheric pressure is not active. It just, they differ by one atmosphere, it depends which gauge you happen to use. Here's a fire extinguisher. It has a heavy walled steel container. Whatever pressure is in that cylinder has nothing to do with atmospheric pressure. It's whatever's in the cylinder. So you could measure the pressure. In fact, most fire extinguishers do have a gauge on them. And if it was an absolute pressure gauge, it would measure the absolute pressure. Usually they're actually gauge pressure gauges and they would measure the total pressure, but they would measure it in terms of gauge pressure. In other words, it would tell you the value minus one atmosphere. But that has nothing to do with atmospheric. It's just the gauge you choose to use on the tank. Likewise, here's a uh, truck. It has a compressed gas container on the back made of steel. It's got tire, which are largely uninfluenced by atmospheric pressure. And the pressure inside this tank, the pressure inside the tire, can be reported as either the absolute pressure or the gauge pressure. You use two different gauges, you get two different values that differ by one atmosphere. Take a look at page 65, please. Here's a bottle of carbonated beverages. Carbonated beverages are pressurized to four atmospheres absolute, roughly, which means it's about three atmospheres gauge pressure in the vapor space here. Then the pressure at the bottom of the tank would be the sum of the vapor pressure plus whatever the pressure of the fluid is, rho GH. Here it is. Let's go back to our vacuum filtration apparatus. Let's just say that we have a filter in here that's kind of plugged. It'll help us to think of this. So really it's more or less insulated from the environment. You know, it's barely dripping through because it's all plugged up. Initially you started with one atmosphere of pressure, then you evacuated it. So let's say now the absolute pressure remaining in this vessel is about 0.6 atmospheres. 
you reduced it by 0.4 atmospheres. So the gauge pressure, if you were to use the gauge pressure gauge, it would measure 0.6 minus 1, it would measure negative 0.4 atmospheres, right? Gauge pressure of a partial vacuum is negative. How much vacuum is being pulled? Well, you'd have to say it's 0.4 atmospheres vacuum. That plus the remaining pressure make one atmosphere. And that's probably enough for this lesson.